There are SE Linux policies for the web server, for the DNS server, for everything that's network facing that you would expect. There are even um, SE Linux policies for like Thunderbird, Firefox, Flash plugins, things like that. So there are SE Linux policies in place for pretty much everything that runs on the system that we provide, either the Fedora project or Red Hat. And everything else runs unconfined. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. So how does SE Linux work? Well, you can figure out what your system is set to, what policy your system is set to, a couple of different ways. If you look at the Etsy SE Linux config file, uh, which is similar to Etsy sysconfig SE Linux, you can see what the policy is set to. You can also run the command SE status, or you can run the command get enforce. So if I look at the Etsy SE Linux config file, I can see, aha, the default behavior for this system when it boots up is that SE Linux will be in enforcing mode, and the policy type is targeted. Or I can just run the SE status command, and it'll tell me that SE Linux is enabled, it is in enforcing mode, and it was set to enforcing at boot time or using the targeted policy. Or if you just want a real quick one-liner, you can use get enforce, and it'll come back and go, yep. It's enforcing. We're good. That's really good for scripting. If you want to run a script to determine whether or not you're in enforcing mode, this is the way to do it. So, how does SE Linux work? There are two concepts that you really need to understand with SE Linux. If you take nothing else away from today's session, labeling and type enforcement. And let me talk about what those mean. Labeling, as I said earlier, everything on the system, files, processes, ports, etc., are all labeled with an SE Linux context. And I'll talk more about those in a minute. For files and directories, those labels are stored as extended attributes in the file system. So if you have a file system that supports X adders, it will generally, excuse me, support SE Linux. Um, for processes, ports, and so on, the kernel manages these labels. It reads the policy when a process instantiates and figures out what label is supposed to be associated with it. And again, I'll show some examples of that in a little while. Now these labels are in the format of the SE Linux user, the SE Linux role, the SE Linux type, and the SE Linux uh, level, which is actually optional, and we'll talk more about that in a little while. For the purposes of this presentation, we're not going to deal with the uh, SE Linux user role or level. Those are used in MLS, multi-level and uh, multi-category security, out of the scope for a one-hour training session. You're not, I'm not going to be able to cover that in one hour. Um, remember that what we really care about for today is the type. Remember, labeling and type enforcement. So. We'll, uh, we'll look at a fairly complex service, uh, one which provides access from the network and provides access all over the file system. Um, the Apache web server is not necessarily insecure. In fact, the default, uh, the default configuration on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux or a Fedora system is actually fairly secure. We actually lock it down fairly tightly, um, but it's very wide-ranging in its access, so uh, it's a really good example. So the Apache web server has a binary executable which it launches from user s -man. If you look at that file as SC Linux context, you will see that it is of the type HTTPD exec type. So if I do an ls-capital-z on the binary, I can see that's the SC Linux context right there. The, the SC Linux user, the object, or I'm sorry, the role, and the type. The only thing we care about right now is HTTPD exec type. So now, if I look at the config directory, it's also got a label, a type. I do an ls-capital-z of Etsy httpd, and now I've got the file system label as httpd config type. If I look at the log file directory, the type is httpd log type, see, var log httpd. If I look at the system content directory, var uh, www html, it's got a label of httpd system content type and so on, and so on, and so on. If I look at the start script, it also has an SE Linux context. Okay, HTTPD and NetRC exec type for NetCRC.D and NetD HTTPD. When the process is run, when I kick off HTTPD, if I do a PS-Z, I can see that even that executable running in the kernel and in memory has a type, HTTPD type. Come on in, I belong. <laughs> if you look at the ports, and this is a little bit different, if you look at the ports upon which the web server listens, you'll see that even those have labels. Now, I did use a different command. Instead of using ps, I used netstat. But netstat, oh wow, you can't see the command I ran. I'm sorry, guys, for some reason this is this playing off the top of the screen. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look down here at the top of the screen, <laughs> 
So I ran netstat. You guys are familiar with netstat? Yeah. 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 So I did netstat with a dash capital Z argument. And I can't see crap. This is awesome. So, sorry, guys. Um, anyway, you'll see that the port number, uh, or, or the, uh, yeah, the port number that it's listening on is also labeled. That's really bizarre. All right, that's a little bit better. Now, I can also use the se manage command, security enhanced Linux management command. I did an se manage port list, and I grabbed out HTTP. And you can see there's an HTTP port, and that's 8443, and then some other commonly used ports that Apache is commonly configured to listen on. Those ports have an SE Linux context as well. Now, the Etsy shadow file has a type of shadow underscore T. So if I do an ls capital Z against it, a shadow underscore T type. Right? So with type enforcement, that's all labeling. Now let's talk about type enforcement. It probably makes sense, and it's logical for us humans to think, well, a process running in the HTTPD type context is going to interact with a file with the HTTPD config type label. That kind of makes sense, right? The process is going to want to be able to look at the config files. Raise your hand if you think that it makes sense for a process running in the HTTPD context to interact with a file with, say, the shadow underscore T label. Because we will all mock you. <laughs> all right? So you see how type enforcement and labeling works? I got labels, and I set a policy that says this type of executable can interact with a file with this type of label. It's actually a lot more simple than people think. People think of SE Linux that, oh, it's so beautiful. Is it one to one? Not one to one, but well, it is sort of one to one. In other words, I can I can say, I'm, well, by default, I can set a policy that says I'm going to allow a, an executable or process running in the HTTP type label to access a, a file, well, not the shadow type, but I can say that. I can do multiple access points, though. I can say, well, it's also going to be able to access a file with, you know, maybe the uh, FTP type. All right. So type enforcement is the part of the policy that says, for instance, a process running with the HTTP type label can uh, have read access to a file labeled HTTP config type. That's all the policy is. Type enforcement and labeling. It's really fairly simple. So how do I deal with these labels? You know, you've seen me run a couple of commands. Um, the dash capital Z argument works with many of the GNU utilities. Okay, so ls takes it, ps, id takes it, netstat takes it, cp <coughs> takes it, um, make dir takes the dash capital Z argument. So you can do make dir dash z and then give it a type, and you can create a directory right out of the gate with the correct se Linux context. You can also use se Linux aware tools like chcon change context. Uh, or RestoreCon to change the context of a file. And I'll talk more about RestoreCon later on. RestoreCon is my favorite, 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 most disfavorite is SE Linux command out there. Because I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of cases, and RestoreCon is the recipe. All right, so contexts are set when, when files are created based on their parents' directories, or the parent directory's context, with a few exceptions, which I'll talk about. Uh, RPM can set context as part of installation. Heck, even the login process sets context. When I log in, I am assigned an SE Linux context. In the targeted policy, everybody's actually in the same context. We only have one type of SE Linux user. More on that in a little while. Um, so um, we've talked about labels. We've talked about type enforcement. Let's talk about file transitions. This one is a little bit odd, but it, it'll make sense in just a second. You can have an application, some application, who type creates a file in a directory with some other type, bar underscore type, for instance. Policy can be written that says, transition that file so that it is created with yet another type, another SE Linux type. So who creates a, a file in bar, but it actually gets created with the context of bats. A real world example of that is, you guys all run uh, probably Network Manager, right? If you're running a laptop, more than likely you're running Network Manager so that you can do Wi-Fi and all that kind of good stuff. Well, Network Manager actually creates a file called resolve.com. Actually, Network Manager takes off DH client, I should say. DH client creates a, a file, resolve.com, labeled as net underscore conf underscore t in a directory called Etsy, which is labeled Etsy t. If we didn't have that transition, resolve.com would have inherited that Etsy t label. What is a transition? A transition is just a rule. It says, when I first create the file, by default, it's going to inherit the Etsy type 
labeled, right? But because I've administratively set a, a transition that says, with these two rules, this type of process in this type of directory, oh, don't inherit, transition over to this third file type, this third uh, content type. Okay. So you can also, uh, you've also can use some other commands, the se manage command, for instance. se manage is incredibly powerful. se manage can be used to manage se Linux settings for uh, user logins, for users, for port uh, interfaces like Ethernet interfaces, uh, kernel modules, se Linux modules, nodes, file context. We will use the file context for a while. Booleans, which I'll talk more in a little, uh, more about in a little while. Um, the permissive state of the system, you can use SE manage to change that. So it's a lot easier in another way. I'll talk about it. And even setting up don't audit rules. So, what does it mean if I get an SE Linux error? Well, it means something's wrong. <laughs> um, turning off SE Linux is like turning the radio up when your car is making a loud noise. You can mask the problem, but that doesn't fix it. So if you uh, get an SE Linux error, do something about it. It could mean a number of things. It could mean something as simple as the labeling is wrong. And that's really common, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. That's really easy to do. It's very easy to get your system in this label. It's not hard. Use the tools to fix the labels. We'll talk more about that in a little while. I'll show you some examples. So it may mean that the SE Linux policy just needs to be tweaked. Turn something on or turn something off. Turn it on a little bit, your system will be happy. Uh, we can do that through Booleans, which I can talk about in a little while, or creating policy modules, which I will show an example of in a little while. There could be a bug in the policy, right? This is human written code. We make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, even Dan. The policy could have a problem with it. So if you do, and you're a, a, an enterprise customer, open a ticket. If you're not an enterprise customer, open a Bugzilla. Um, be aware that with Bugzilla reports, there is no SLA around it, no service level agreement around it, so we will fix it when, when we can. Yes? Uh, what am I going to do if, if an application is trying to access stuff it shouldn't, it definitely shouldn't? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not going to work around that, but I file a bug. With the application it. developer. Okay. Yeah, so if you've got an application, so real common, real common um, uh, example of that is uh, folks will do things like, um, Insecure temp files or leaking file descriptors, that's super common. I get SE Linux alerts all the time on applications that are leaking file descriptors. Open a bug with the, with the vendor of the application. Let them know what's going on. Patch is cheerfully accepted if it's open source. Um, but I'll be honest with you, sometimes they're like, eh, just turn off SE Linux. Yeah, that's point them to my video on YouTube. Okay? <laughs> this video, SE Linux from your morals. Tell them that even if Thomas Cameron can write SE Linux policy modules, you can write SE Linux policy modules. He ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. All right. So the final thing that if when you get an error message is you're being broken into and the battle stations. That happens. I was presenting on security enhanced Linux at Texas Linux Fest like three years ago. Phone oh, just blowing up. I mean, I'm getting all these text messages while I'm up on stage, right, presenting. Finally, get done. I walk down and I, I look at it. No, customer minds like, hey, I'm getting all these things that are talking about ABC denials. Hey, I'm getting all this access vector control denial messages about SE Linux. What do I do? And I SSH into his box, and he had screwed up his PHP.ini file. Easy to do, man. Human error, not a big problem. He had configured his system so that guys could upload scripts and execute. Always a good idea in a publicly facing web server. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he was getting all these SE Linux alerts. And what had happened was that guy had uploaded a script and had executed the script. And it tried to go and access things like the SE shadow file and the uh, contents of people's home directory because we were running SE Linux in enforcing mode, even though his system got compromised and no valuable data was lost. So it works. I mean, that's one of the big advantages, right? It's partitioning off. Yep. 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 All right, so you've heard me talk about Booleans. What are Booleans? Really, the simplest answer is Booleans are just on-off switches for SE Linux features. Um, for simple stuff, uh, like do we allow the FTP server access to home directories? Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes you absolutely want that. Mm, but I'll turn that off, though, because that can potentially, here's your foot, here's the pistol. <laughs> Ready? Aim? Yeah. So uh, to more esoteric stuff, like HTTPD can use mod off NTLM when bind. You do that every day, right? Yeah. Anyway, there are policies, there are by default policies uh, or settings, on off settings called Booleans. To see all of the Booleans, you can run the command get sebool a for all. And it looks something like this. There's a zillion of them, there's a ton of them. 
Um, there's a lot of, and each one of these is a different page. So I've got, you know, things like, do I allow HTTPD anonymous write access? No. Um, do I allow HTTPD to use re, uh, user content or home directories? Um, do I allow unconfined logging? You know, there's all kinds of Booleans that I can turn on or off. To set a Boolean, use set se bool, whatever the Boolean is, and zero or one or on or off. If you want to make it permanent, pass the dash capital P for permanent argument to set se bool. Um, a couple of tips. A couple of tips. Install the SE Troubleshoot and SE Troubleshoot dash server RPMs on any machine that you're doing any, any SE Linux work on. Um, they drag in a bunch of tools to help you diagnose and fix SE Linux uh, issues. Either reboot or restart Audit D after you install these. I just restart Audit D, but if you're a Windows admin, just reboot. You'll feel better. So, yum y install SE Troubleshoot and SE Troubleshoot server. It will drag in a whole bunch of other stuff, like a bunch of uh, graphical utilities for doing SE Linux management. Really, really cool. Restart the Audit D service, and away we go. Or if you're Windows Um So, let's talk about some real world examples, some real world uh, cases where I've seen people do silly stuff. This is totally easy. Now, most of these real world examples, honestly, yeah, they would be me screwing stuff up. Um, so let's say I got a user Fred who wants to have his own web page and slash home slash Fred slash public underscore HTML on a public web server. That's perfectly fine. That happens a lot. So you being the good sysadmin, you go and you enable user dir in the HTTP.com uh, file and you restart the web server, right? And you go and you edit it and you change it from user dir disabled to user dir is public underscore HTML. I, I'm good. I set that. And I set the permissions so that the web server can access his home directory, right? So I got to do uh, Jamad other plus execute on slash home slash spread so that the HTTP process using discretionary access control has access to slash home slash spread with execute privileges, right? So I set that. Fred logs in. He creates his public underscore HTML. Uh, I'm sorry, his public underscore HTML directory and creates an index.html file. So I log in. Who am I? Okay, I'm logged into spread. I make that public HTML directory and I create a an ultra sophisticated index.html file. This is my home page, right? My little home on the internet. So I create it. We're all good. I fire up my web browser and, and you do not have permission to access slash it'll be Fred. Man. Okay, I don't have permissions, right? So what are you gonna do? I <laughs> all the time. All the time. I'm not sure, so I'm gonna just here's my foot. Do the thing with the bullet. Yeah, don't do that. And now I smack you. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean honestly you're gonna check the usual suspects, right? I'm gonna go look at access log and error log. Var dev or sorry, var log uh, HTDVD. So I go to look at access log and it says permission denied. Well thanks, that doesn't help. Don't do that. So, okay, cool, I'm going to go look at the error log. And the error log says, I need permission denied. <laughs> so, since we already knew that, I'm going to go take a peek in bar log messages just to see if anything interesting is there. And I go and I look and I love this. I'm like, hey, wow, ooh, ah, SE Linux. SE Linux is, present, is preventing HTTPD from, access, oh, from getting attribute access on the directory slash home slash spread. Wait a minute, for complete SE Linux messages, run this command. Copy and paste this this command, this one right here. Copy and paste this command. So you copy and paste this command. I love this. It's like, ah, okay, cool. I run it and it says, hey, there are two issues, user content and HTTP or HTTP the access to home directories. Check this out. I run this command and it says, hey, SE Linux is preventing it. If you want to allow access, you must tell SE Linux and you have to enable the HTTP three user content Boolean. You can read the man page on it, or just run this command. Type this, copy and paste this command to fix your SE Linux problem. So it also says we can create a policy module to allow this, but in this case, setting the Boolean is a lot easier and makes a lot more sense. You don't need to create a whole policy module when it's saying, run this command, Sparky. Okay? So we run the command. Uh, that, that's the part where it says you can create the uh, uh, policy module. So we run the command. We set the two booleans. It's really simple. Set se bool, make it permanent. HTTP can, can read user content. And then set se bool, make it permanent. HTTPD enable home directories. I run the command. I restart. And voila, my home directory is up and running. 
Everybody says this is going to be so hard. Not bar messages. It is. You don't have SC troubleshoot, messy troubleshoot server. Do not get argued. Kind of sucks. Kind of cryptic. Kind of like Rel Four back in the day. Where finally, after three months, went I give up. We got tools that can make it a lot easier. I don't buy the argument in 2013. This is too hard. Does anybody else out there think that copying and pasting commands is too hard? Many mm -hmm. people do. What's that? Many yeah. people do. I know. But. I know. And it kills me. Um, so anyway, I don't buy that it's too hard. So how can I see what booleans have been set? And I'm sorry, the top of this is so getting kind of off. So go look at the booleans.local file under Etsy SE Linux targeted modules active. Or if you're lazy like me, find <laughs> slash Etsy slash SE Linux dash name star.local. It'll show you all of the changes that have been made to SE Linux policy on a local machine. And so if I go and I look at that file, Etsy SE Linux targeted modules active booleans.local, it'll say do not edit directly. It's not kidding, folks. That is not a joke. <laughs> Don't edit it directly, but it'll tell you what Boolean's change. And I'll let you, the reason that you don't change it locally is because it doesn't have any effect. It's not to break anything, you can delete that file. It doesn't matter. This is, that's, those are your people, aren't they? No. Those sorority girls. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got to give you a hard time. She talked about her sorority life uh, back in the day. But um, this file gets generated when you rebuild the policy. This whole directory structure will actually be deleted and rebuilt when you reset policy. So if you can modify this all day long, it will do zero good. And in fact, it will be deleted later on. So note that when you use set sc bool dash p and other commands we'll cover later, the entire Etsy, SE Linux target directory gets rebuilt. Um, the file doesn't actually do anything. It just tells you what's been set. So we'll even when it says do not edit it directly. And I'll show you, I did this little, little experiment. I created a file, a marker file, just touched the file, and then I ran set se bool, made a permanent change, and then I said find everything under the SCSE Linux directory that's newer than that marker file that I just created. So this is command, 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 right? And that would be pretty much everything under the directory, because like I said, it regenerates that entire directory structure, deletes it, and rebuilds it when you run anything that makes permanent changes to SE Linux. Just be aware of that. All right, so the next example uh, assumes an unmodified SE Linux environment. So ignore what we just did with, with Fred's uh, home directory. Now we're going to talk about Wilma. Wilma is a web content author. She has created content in her home directory, and she has called you up and said, hey, I'm done with my extra special web editing. Can you please promote that into production? You being the good sysadmin like you are, do exactly what she says, and you move it over to the bar HTML directory, right? So. Wilma created a directory called content, and she created an index.html file to start a website. I didn't say she was a good web developer. I just said she was a web developer. So she creates her content. She calls you up. She says, all right, I'm done. Our web page is made. Can you please move that over? You being a good sysadmin, do exactly what she said. It says you move home content or home Wilma content star to var www html, right? And I went to go to test it, and Oh, 2777. Seven, seven, seven. The world access. <laughs> ah, and you're like, wait a minute, I know. I move. It's Wilma. It's owned by Wilma. Aha, that must be the problem, right? So you do an ls shell. Oh, see, I'm so smart. I'm a good sysadmin. I figured it out. So I'm going to do chown, and I do a look. Oh, look. See, look. The permissions are good. It's owned by. Okay, we're golden, right? And dang it. What did I do? I look at bar log messages, and again, it tells you to run SE alert. So, hey, look, it's preventing access. So I run SE alert. I copy and paste that command, and it comes back, and it says, wait a minute, this is a little bit confusing, because it comes back, and it says, this, there's user content. I need to allow user content. Wait, no, this isn't user content. This is, oh, wait a minute. I changed the ownership, but... If I do of ls dash capital Z, oh wait a minute, user home type. Where was that content created? In a user's home directory. What did we do with it? Did we copy it or did we move it? We moved it. What happens when you move? It, it retains its extended attributes, and the extended attributes for SE Linux context says, oh wait, this is the user home directory. <laughs> Whoopsie. So. The file kept its original context. To change the context, we can run one of a couple of commands. 
Um, you can do, well, first you need to figure out what it should be, right? What should this context be? So I can look at a known good file label. So I do an ls capital Z of var dub 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 HTML. No, no, aha, it needs to be HTTP system content type. So I can use chcon, change context. The long form of that is change context, the user type, the role type, and then the, or I'm sorry, the, uh, okay, uh, chcon dash u, the user, dash r, the role, and dash t, the type. Um, anyone else type horrifically badly? I, especially when you've got a crisis and the website's down and your manager and the web developer and everyone else is looking at you just like this saying, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? <laughs> right? So, I mean, I'm like, don't, because I can't type. I'm going to have to elbow you in the face right now. So you can do this, and that's perfectly fine. Or you can do the shorter form. We really only care about the type. So chcon type, HTTP system content type, rwwhtml, index.html. That'll work too. Now, I'm lazy. I'll be the first one to admit it. I am lazy. So if I want to just reference a known good context, the easy way to do this is change context, reference this known good directory, and set that one to it. chcon dash dash reference. I'm lazy. I like this. Now, if you just want to restore a directory and all of its contents to the default context, you can also use RestoreCon. I love RestoreCon. I love it. It's easy. I don't have to know what the correct context is. I mean, if I know that the directory structure has the right context label set, then what I can do is just say RestoreCon of r dub 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 HTML and do v to be verbose and r to be recursive. Just go fix it. So I run RestoreCon and it goes, hey, I reset index.html, which was user home type, and I changed it to HTTP system content type. And I do that, and da -da -da, my website is now up and running. Yes, sir. So when you're doing that and you, you change the context, does the DAC permissions matter at all? Like not a bit. It's, it got changed to normal because it got moved. Well, do you have to change that or do you not? Remember, we used ch uh, ch own chound. Yeah. I chound it over to root, and that is discretionary. But does that need to be changed? Um, yeah, I mean, it'll still need to be changed. Yeah, you'll need to do both. Okay. Basically, the most restrictive setting wins. Okay. Right. So if I've got discretionary access control that's super wide open, but I've got mandatory access control that's restrictive, it's restricted. Ditto, if I've got mandatory access control that's completely wide open, but I've got discretionary access control that is restrictive, it is restricted. So least restrictive wins. Okay, All right, so where are these contexts stored? Did you say least or most restrictive? I meant most. Did I say least? Yes, you did. Yeah, I'm, I'm an idiot. Most. Most restrictive wins. It's my fault. It's early and I haven't finished this yet. Just hang an IV bag here in just a second. Hold on, just a minute. Uh, I didn't drop it though. All right, so if I want to see what the default contexts are, I can go take a look at um, Etsy, Etsy Linux targeted contexts files, files underscore context. There are some other files in that directory, but for that one, uh, uh, just be aware there are over 4 thousand SE Linux contexts defined in that file. So don't modify it directly. Your changes will be lost. Okay. Um, so if you look in there, it's it's kind of cool. And also, guys, you can cheat. You can use this to reference for other stuff I'm going to show you in a little while. See that regular expression that says like slash mount and everything underneath it is going to get the type mount type. And you know dev star mouse star is going to get the mouse device type. So there's I mean literally like thousands of entries in here. Um, and uh, use this as a reference later on, but don't modify it directly. Now, some other real-world examples. Someone tells you that they want to create a web directory somewhere non-standard. We're going to create a website and slash who slash bar. Okay. Uh, for a virtual website. So you create the directory, make their slash who slash bar. You look good ls on it. It's there. We know that it's there. Everything's good. You define the virtual website, httpd.com. So I've got virtual host. Slash the document root is foo bar and the server name is dummyhost.example.com. So we're good there. We've got it set up. You create the index.html file. This is my dummyhostexample.com web page into foo bar index.html. You cat it, it's there, everything's good. You restart the web server, it comes back up, life is golden, and I fire up my web page and huh? Where's my index.html file? Why is it not there? So, which log file should we check? Our log messages. Very good. 
So we take a look at Varlog messages, and sure enough, it says, hey, SC Linux is stopping you from doing what you want to do. Run this command. So I run this command. Eee, this one comes back and it's a little less intuitive. This one comes back and it says, well, you need to change the label on foobar index.html. So what you can do is use se manage to change the file context and add the type, some kind of file type, to this. Unfortunately, the file type can be any one of all of the, holy crap, right? So I, I'm so confused. What can we do to figure out what that file type may need to be? Oh, do note that at the end, it tells you to set the file context and then restore the file context. And so it says, make sure that you restore it against it. Now, what directory should we take a look at to figure out what the correct context is? It's web content. What's another web content directory that we know is labeled correctly? Bar www.html, right? So what I can do is I can do an ls z on bar www, look at html, and here we go, system content, HTTP system content type. So we actually want everything under foo to have the right context. So we're going to use a regular expression. And again, you can cheat and grab that regular expression out of that file underscore context files. Because I, I don't know about you guys, I don't write code for a living. It's not what I do. I don't even do bash programming for a living. I do it every once in a while. I always just suck at regular expressions. I have to go and find them again. So I cheat. Go look at that. So what I'm going to do is I find the HTML directory, and there's my HTTP sys content type. So I'm going to do se manage, and I'm going to tell se manage to change the file context. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the type, HTTP system content type, to, and I use a regular expression, foo and everything under it. Now note, when I set this, all I'm doing is I'm telling SE Linux, hey, this is what the context needs to be for files under that directory. Have I actually made any changes to the file system at that point? No. All I've done is I've set the entry in the SE Linux configuration. So once I do that, oh, by the way, lazy. First one I'm I'm lazy. You can also use the dash e equals argument to se manage f context. So I can say se manage f context add the equivalent of var www to foo. Yeah, I know. Laziness rules. So if I go cat the file context subs directory, you'll note that it says the equivalent, uh, we're going to set the equivalent of foo to var, uh, I'm sorry, foo and everything under it to var www. Now we need to run restorecon. So I run restorecon against the directory. And it says I'm resetting foo, foobar, and foobar index.html, and I'm changing them over to the correct context. Now I test the website. Okay. Well, I see dummyhost.example.com. There's not a recursive. You have to use a regular expression to do it. Um, you can either do the dash e, um, or I prefer to do I prefer to to set the context directly by using that regular expression, saying put foo and everything underneath it. That's my preference. All right, so that works. So what happens when all of these things that we've talked about so far, changing permissions or changing uh, uh, context, what happens when all of those fail? What happens when we actually do get to the point where something fails and it says, you need to create a policy module? Um, in the case that a Boolean or labeling doesn't fix your issue, you may have to create a policy module, and that's perfectly fine. In this example, I actually uh, was installing Squirrel Mail on my machine at home. Squirrel Mail is that web, web mail uh, application. It's really cool, works really well, I like it a lot. Um, so I went to go install it. I set it up, I got it configured, I restarted my web service, everything's gold, and I go to log in and doesn't let me doesn't let me do it. It says, wait a minute, error connecting to IMAP server. Hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. So and sure enough, I go through and I look and I see a bunch of uh, ABC denies, access vector control deny messages under var log audit audit.log. Now, raise your hand if you think that, that is intuitive. Shut up, Dan. <laughs> you out of class, you're not moral. <laughs> this is what we used to have to kind of dig through and try to figure out, like back in the RHEL 4 days. This was fairly cryptic and painful. So I go look at Varlog messages, and sure enough, it comes back and it says, hey, there's a problem. Run this command. So I run se alert against it. Um, long story short, um, I know that there's an se Linux issue. So at this point, because I'm testing an application, what I actually did was I set se Linux permissive mode. So uh, set in course zero. I run the application. I run it through all of its paces. What that will do is, because SE Linux is in permissive mode, it'll let the application continue on, and it'll just log what it would have blocked had it been in uh, enforcing mode. So I run through it, done that through them. Um, if you don't do this, if you leave it in uh, enforcing mode, 
then you'll fix one problem and expose the next one. You'll fix that problem and expose the next one. You fix that problem. It's a long kind of painful process. So I like to just run the application through the paces and then catch all of them. So I go through. I set in course zero. Um, I send an email. I receive an email. I log into another user. I respond. So I I run the application through all of its paces. And sure enough, I think I'm in good shape. Now I run SE alert and it says, hey, here's some of the problems that it's running. I like this. It'll actually come back and it'll say, now what you need to do is grab HTTPD, for instance, out of bar log, audit, audit, audit. Y'all be aware that we're 15 minutes off. Right? We started 15 minutes, you're not late. We got about 12 more minutes. Um, so, um, Anyway, you can grab HTTPD at audit.log and run it through audit to allow. So, when you get done doing that, you run that command, grep HTTPD from audit.log, run, run it through audit to allow dash m. I generally name my local policies with the, the word local in them so that I can tell which ones are mine. And when I get done, I run SE module install the squirrel local policy module. Um, now, the reality is that the error that I'm showing you could have been fixed by setting a Boolean. But uh, I want to show you creating the policy module just so you can see how it's done. So when I do audit to allow, it creates the type enforcement file, and then it also creates the actual uh, binary. And it's kind of cool. You can look at this and tell what SD Linux is saying. It's saying, OK, so require for HTTP type, SMTP port type, and pop port type, class domain, uh, I'm sorry, class TCP socket name connect, really what happens is it's just saying, I'm going to set a policy module that allows HTTP type to connect to SMTP port type um, and, and we're not going to block it using SE Linux. So that's the plain text kind of human readable part of it. There's actually a, a policy file, a binary policy file. You can do SE module install, so dash I to install that uh, squirrel local policy file. Now I turn SE Linux back on using the command that's on Dan's shirt, SE, uh, set in force one. And I log in. It works. I can go to send mail, receive mail, everything's good, and I don't get any error messages. So. That's how you would take a, a uh, an application that you're trying to bring into your environment. Um, that's the easy way to set it up. Now, be aware. In all of these examples, I've talked about how it'll tell you what you can do to stop SE Linux from stopping stopping what you're doing. Right? Just because you can do a thing doesn't necessarily mean that you should do a thing. And what I mean by that is. If you're just randomly getting SE Linux errors, and you're like, well, I don't want to have those anymore. I'm going to turn it off. That is potentially a bad thing, right? Because something could be happening on your system that actually does put you at risk. So make sure that you do a little bit of research. Make sure you understand the ramifications of disabling or enabling a, a, an SE Linux feature or policy module. But just make sure you understand what you're doing before you do it. Don't blindly follow the instructions. All right. So enabling SE Linux. To enable SE Linux on a system, modify the file Etsy SE Linux config and set SE Linux to permissive. If you have a system that has been running with SE Linux disabled for a while, don't just turn it on to enforcing. You will have a very bad day. Okay? You can fix it really easily. But so don't send it to enforcing as it will more than likely hang at boot time. That is the voice of experience talking. Um, so you go in and you modify the file, you change it over to permissive under the uh, uh, enforcing type. Create a file in the root of the file system called dot auto relabel. And that's simple. You just touch the file called slash dot auto relabel. And you reboot. The system will relabel the file system. And it'll take a while. You'll see it boot up and you'll see this little progress bar going across. I have found that it generally takes roughly the same amount of time as the file system check does. About the same amount of time. Um, you can also run the command fix files relabel, but don't do it if you're booted up into uh, run level 5. Because it'll ask you and it recommends you it deletes everything underneath the temp directory, including including the files that the X font server uses. And your X window session will get really cranky if that directory goes away. So don't do it in run level five. Do it in the command line. And that's what it looks like. Fix files relay, fix files relabel. It'll go through and say, Do you wish to clean out them? And you say yes, and then you just reboot the system. After everything is relabeled, then set it back to enforcing. So modify Etsy, Etsy, Linux config and reboot or run set enforce one. So, graphical tools. If you're a Windows admin, don't despair. We have point and click. Install the. I like to install the uh, bitmap fix fonts, or you can do young group install fonts. And policy core utils GUI. 
then you can SSH capital X into the machine. That'll display, that'll export your display over to your desktop and run system config SE Linux. And here's what that looks like. So we install all those packages. Um, and when we get done, you'll see there's actually a fair list of packages we got installed. I run system config SE Linux and this is actually fairly straightforward. So I get a graphical tool. And here's what's cool. Remember all those text files we're looking at? Where we go to see what the default enforcing mode, what the current enforcing mode is, and what policy is. Ooh. These drop downs and everything. Relabel on next reboot. What file does that create? Auto relabel. relabel. That's all it does. You click the checkbox and you create the file and you reboot. Right? Booleans. You remember we set some booleans? Well, here's what's kind of cool. I can actually go through and I can do a filter and I can say, um, I have an example of a filter. Anyway, so the booleans that get set, you know, you can turn on or off all those booleans that we were looking at, at get se bool, at se bool. I can do those through here as well. I can look at file labels. You remember all those thousands of entries under the uh, file underscore context files? Well, they're right here as well. Under, it's labeled with the HTTP system content type. It shows up in here as well. You can set it in here as well. Uh, network ports are defined in here, just like uh, we did from the command line. Um, in fact, you remember when we used uh, um, se manage port and we did a, a grep? You can do a very similar thing right here. se manage port, uh, kind of a graphical representation of it. Uh, and then policy modules. The policy modules are defined right there. And in fact, if I go and I look for my squirrel local file, there's that policy module that I created to enable squirrel uh, squirrel mail. Do you edit modules there? Um, you can add and remove them, um, and you can turn on or turn off. Would you actually? I, I would. Yeah. So dash i or dash r. Yeah, but beyond that, you'd probably want to go from step up out of the command line. Uh, so anyway, hopefully, if you felt like that 98-pound weakling at the beginning of the session, you look a little bit more like the guy who's going to the bolt a little bit. Um, so final thoughts. Don't turn it off. SE Linux can save you in the beneficiary of SE Linux capabilities. It's a lot easier to use today than when I first. Folks, unfortunately. Right? Oh, oh. In open source. <clears throat> a lot easier than it used to be. Really, you got you know, NSA grade security that's available on your machines at no extra cost. So absolutely worth using. Uh, if you like today's presentation, let me know. I think they're doing an evaluation. I think they're doing an evaluation. Yeah, so you know, if you, if you like today's session, let me know. If you didn't like today's session, come talk to me privately, and I promise I'll take your comments under advice. Uh, there are some additional resources you need to be aware of. The SE Linux, or the Security Against Linux Guide at access.redhat.com is actually really good. Access.redhat.com and look at the product documentation. There's some fantastic resources. The SE Linux guys did there. Um, that's kind of where Dan hangs out. I'm using a lot more of, of the leading edge stuff. Um, and then if you're going to be using this in an enterprise environment, come check out redhat.com slash training. There is a policy class, the RH420 or RHS 429. Um, I walked into RHS 429, frankly, a little terrified because, like I said, I'm not a developer. I'm not a software guy, right? I'm just an old Unix guy, um, old Unix sysadmin. Um, I walked out of that class four days later going, holy crap, this is really cool, and even I can do it. So, good class. <laughs> Access.redhat.com also has several videos about SE Linux. Dave Eck, who is my peer in the Solutions Architect team, uh, and Dan Walsh, actually, right here, have uh, covered topics from finding users to sandboxing. There's a ton of really good information at access.redhat.com. And then, obviously, uh, you know, if you want to see what's coming on the pipe, look at Dan's uh, blog, danwalsh.lightjournal.com. Yes, sir. Um, self updating applications. Is there any way of handling 
applications that are best in a slide. So you mean like they check in, they phone home, and pull down updates of that? Well, actually, there, there, uh, there is an SE Linux um, policy on the ability to install plugins for Firefox Direct. Just work. Very crazy, you might say. Drupal, I'm not sure if it's Drupal. A random, unreviewed. Like that, then, um, you know, click here. Yeah. That, I mean, SC Linux, the, the benefit of SC Linux is if those plugins are written badly and they misbehave, in many cases, SC Linux uh, parts of the file system. That <clears throat> You can also, I mean, plenty of find something unconfined. But that's, that's not the best way to do it. Yes, sir. I'm guessing I'm right in assuming that there's not a, it's not an either or. You can't use SE Linux to grant privileges okay. that uh, that you can't get because the kernel says Correct. you can't, like binding to a low port if you're not root. Correct. Still yeah, the, the least restrictive right. setting will win. So, most, most. I mean, most. God, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gotta have more of this. No, the most restrictive setting, sorry. Yeah, so if it's, if it's conflict between DAC and kernel privileges and Mac, whatever is most restrictive will win. All right, guys, thank you very much. We're at 115. <laughs> Hit the end broadcast button.